so as we discussed last time we'll have a lecture on uh, reverse genetics as a tool to understand uh, developmental processes or how these tools from genomics are employed to answer some of the genes which uh, some of the questions we are interested in in developmental biology and these tools all these tools which we have covered so far um, you have to learn where to apply them uh, it's not important at the moment to learn about you know the detailed methodology that's not important you just need to have a concept uh, which tool is appropriate uh, to be used to bring an answer to a certain question so in case of uh, reverse genetics um, what we uh, do we have you know a candidate gene in our mind um, we have an idea uh, about a single gene or a set of genes which we want to analyze so we call this approach as from gene to function normally in contrast to the reverse genetics you all know there is uh, forward genetics and in case of forward genetics you know we uh, go from from just nothing no idea about genes we are just interested in a certain biological question it's more like finding a needle in the haystack where we uh, go through um, mutagenesis random mutagenesis and then you know each gene in the whole genome is like a candidate gene there and then from phenotype we go and try to map the gene etc but in 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 contrast in reverse genetics we have a candidate gene uh, you know if we know its location it's okay um, when we'll have the candidate gene in mind in post genomic era where more or less every organism is uh, sequenced we know its position even if we don't know the position we have the sequence of the gene so we can simply through fish we can map its position or through genomic clones uh, from genomic library we can uh, fish out this gene um, if we know the gene already uh, we'll go and search for uh, known mutations which exist in databases you know if we are in fly if others are in c elegans or abidopsis you know there are uh, databases which document every mutation uh, all across the genome in a model system so you just uh, order that mutation or you get that mutation and you try to see uh, what kind of mutation is there um, what kind of uh, whether you know it's disrupting the whole gene uh, is it a null mutation you you uh, isolate total rna and then uh, read uh, mrna expression or the western blot etc to see if gene is being expressed completely uh, inactive etc uh, through southern blot also you can see the uh, kind of defects in the uh, in a particular gene if you don't have a mutant but you know the gene already you can simply do knockout by homologous recombination and nowadays you can do simply by crispr uh, you know and you can uh, then analyze the phenotype because here the the whole idea is that the gene which you are analyzing is known you have an educated guess based on literature based on you know already published material and you you can draw a picture uh, that you know this particular gene may have 
a role in this, uh, in a specific process you are interested in. Um, this insertional mutagenesis can uh, also be carried out. Um, you know, in, in the past we had uh, in Arabidopsis these tDNA lines, uh, or in flies we have these p element lines existing. You can simply do uh, inverse PCR and find what kind of insertion they carry. So these are um, like you know uh, homologous recombination we covered previously using Cree lock system, uh, but nowadays you know using CRISPR you can. Uh, knock out a specific gene or gene of interest uh, much more efficiently and rapidly as compared to Cre-lock system, which used to take a lot of time. Now, uh, there are other methods as well, um, because as I said earlier, the whole idea is you already know the gene. You have an idea that, you know, mm, gene uh, a or B or X or Y or Z, they are involved in a process uh, of, let's say, eye development. Let's say we are interested in the eye development. And you will use either of these uh, methods to you know, acquire a mutant, a known mutant, and then see if mutation, known mutations which already exist, if they have uh, eye phenotype, if they show some phenotype in eye, and then uh, it's much different than, you know, screening all uh, 15,000 to 20,000 genes in, in, in flies to, which is what we do in forward genetics through random mutagenesis. When we know genes, uh, you can also inactivate genes using antisense RNA or ribozyme or uh, RNA interference. Uh, this is also a very uh, useful tool, this post-transcriptional inactivation. And I would like to uh, spend more time on this because people have designed many reverse uh, genetic screens. However, uh, in case of reverse genetic screens, uh, you need to have a good reporter system, I would say. Or you should know, uh, let's say if I'm interested in eye development and I'm working in Drosophila melanogaster or any other organism. Now, based on all the literature search, I can pick up, let's say 50 genes and make double-stranded RNA against them, okay? Or have uh, RNAi lines, so transgenic flies, transgenic flies, which carry RNAi constructs when they will be, so they are usually UA, under US promoter, RNAi, okay? And when we cross them with some GAL4 driver line in a tissue specific manner, this RNAi will result in production of double stranded RNA, this construct, and this will be cleaved by DICER and the homologous, so the SARNA is generated from this double stranded RNA, they will go and bind to the uh, homologous sequences in the mRNA level. And you know, let's say this is messenger RNA from the endogenous, the wild type locus of gene A being expressed in the cells. And we have expressed the RNAi construct. This will bind here and DICER will cleave. And what we call, we say we have knocked, knocked down. Gene A is knocked down, okay? Expression is being reduced. And then either we will look at the I phenotype or we can do all this in cells, you know? 
this is in vivo when we are doing in flies all this is so in flies all this is in in vivo but let's say we are uh, we decided to do same thing in cells but in this we call ex vivo now in cells we don't have eyes we don't have eye structure we have nothing what we will have to have is a readout okay so in order to have a readout we need to have some genes which are eye specific genes eye specific genes which are expressed in these cells when we will knock down a we are then going to through reverse transcription pcr we are then going to determine the expression of these eye specific genes in in these cells so you need to have a complete strategy in your mind that if i am going to ask a specific question what will be my readout we can also um, let me go to some more uh, clean slide so a scale for system or let me add a slide here can you still see my screen yes sir can you see my screen still yes sir so if we are doing our nai as i told you in vivo it's easy you have a phenotype in your mind that i'll take you know 50 different rnai lines they are they are available from genome database in in flies uh but since these are candidate genes if these fly lines are not available you can make your own transgenic lines by having us clone you know inverted repeat construct under us and then cross with gal4 and then do the analysis look at the i phenotype in case of mammals mouse human cell lines if you are using you cannot use you know in in flies we we, we use 200 to 400 base pair such long double stranded line in mammals you use specifically 21 nucleotide long siRNAs and you can get them synthesized this is very fast okay you don't use long double stranded rnas because in mammals they are going to induce interferon response and that is going to mess up all your analysis okay so you use specifically these sirnas uh, short interfering rnas in mammals and then uh, incubate these sirnas with cell lines to do the reverse genetics Uh, of candidate genes however as i said it's very important to have readout if you go in cell line if you are in flies in mammals wherever whichever model system you're going in uh, cells now you need to have a readout readout means a reporter let's say we are interested in i development what we will do will take an i specific gene which is expressed specifically in eyes which means we'll have to have some cis acting elements some enhancers promoters etc which are only and only expressed in eyes and then have 
GFP or Lucifres or you know some uh, reporter which can be quantified or visualized. What we do, we have our reporter in cells. Let's say this is a Lucifer, and Lucifer's reporter has been very extensively used because this can be quantified, okay, using uh, high throughput methods. GFP can also be used, but GFP can only be visualized. We cannot really quantify things there as precisely as we, we can do for Lucifer's. So you make, you can do the, this in transiently transfected cells. Transient transfection means you have this reporter plus siRNAs or double-stranded RNA for your candidate genes one by one. And we do this in these, you know, 96 well plates or 384 well plates, et cetera. Uh, they contain these small wells. Uh, these are, you know, very handy. You can have, let's say I'm drawing a 384 well plate. So which means there will, this is one well, this is second. So there are 384 wells here. And you can, ideally you can do 384 independent experiments here. So you have uh, your cells, then siRNAs or double strand RNA for gene A here, again here, again here. So in triplicate you do, and then you have some negative controls, you have positive controls. And for example, in this case, a positive control can be, uh, you know, double stranded RNA against Lucifer's. So Lucifer's will be knocked down, which means knockdown is happening. Now, some of the genes can be very essential and they can lead to death. What we do, we, in order to monitor cell viability as well as you know non-specific effects, in addition to this reporter, which is an I specific, we also include a reporter which is constitutive. And this constitutive reporter is under actin promoter, which is constitutive. And this one is also leucifrase but a different one, we call this Renella leucifrase. Renella leucifrase has a different substrate as compared to this one. This one is firefly. So our reporter is, an, is uh, having firefly leucifrase and Renella leucifrase is under actin promoter. So now you have two reporters and after five days of incubation, you will add substrate for firefly leucifrase as well as Renella leucifrase. In each well, you will get certain value for Renella leucifrase because it is being constitutively active. And if your gene, if your reporter is an, under an I specific enhancer, and in your cells, let's say in these cells, this enhancer is not active because this is not an uh, I specific cell line or whatever. So this is silent. When you will knock down your gene A or B or C one by one, if they are interfering, they are, they are I specific genes, let's say you knock them down and this enhancer, the silencing of this enhancer is disrupted and this leucifrase gets active, you will see certain value of firefly leucifrase as well. So you normalize, Firefly leucifrase, we call it firefly leucifrase F look with you know the Renella leucifrase, and you get certain values. You can do this experiment for whole genome, even. Imagine so instead of just restricting yourself to 
10 or 20 or 50 genes, you take these 384 well plates. And you have, you know, double stranded RNAs for each gene in fly genome or mouse genome already present here in the wells. You bring in your cells with the construct. You can transfer here in transiently. And then you can imagine, let's say you, you are going to screen 15,000 genes fly genes, for example, or let's say mammalian genes, you will have a couple of uh, hundred uh, um, such plates because each plate is going to have positive controls, negative controls, each gene is going to be knocked down in triplicates. And then within five days, so after this incubation with double strand RNA, in five days, you will get, you know, firefly leucifrase and Renella leucifrase values for each of the 15,000 genes you knocked on. And you will see if leucifrase is going up. There are two scenarios. Your leucifrase can be active already when you add. So your leucifrase is already active, which means some I specific enhancer are acting on that. In that case, you will see if we are interfering, some of these genes are interfering in I developmental pathway, we will see leucifrase going down. If our I specific leucifrase reporter is active already, if it goes down, we uh, again conclude that some of the genes are interfering uh, with I development. Now, out of these, 15,000, let's say you get 100 genes and you will call them candidate genes because you're not confident, candidate genes. So this is what you have done. You have done a genome-wide reverse genetic screen. Imagine going through forward genetics how difficult it is to create 15,000 loss of function mutants or, you know, uh, ran through random mutagenesis, how many independent uh, mutants, whether you are in mouse or flies or C. elegans, you will have to screen. Here in five days, you could do this. Okay. And out of these candidate genes, you say, okay, this is just the first list. Now you will focus on these 100 candidate genes and repeat all this, and this will be called secondary screen. This was the primary screen where you screened all 15,000 genes. In secondary screen, you knock down one by one, again in triplicates, these now 100 candidate genes, along with the same reporters. F leucifrase, firefly leucifrase, and Renella leucifrase. Again, you will get certain values. You calculate the z score of these values, calculate the significance, okay, statistical significance. And then you say, okay, in secondary screen, I could not reproduce 20 genes. They show irreproducible, but 80 genes are highly reproducible. Now you take these 80 genes, you can order their mutants, fly mutants or C. elegant mutants or mouse mutants, etc. So you started from cell line, you got genes which are involved in a specific cellular function you're interested in. And from here, now, because you have to bring in everything in physiological context, once you will have mutants, you will then look at the I phenotype. Whether your findings in cell, ex vivo findings, actually holds true in vivo too. Is it clear so far?
is it clear so far are you all there yes sir so imagine you can do these screen such screens people have done for wingless pathway so you take sorry so you take wingless responsive element so what you know from literature already when wingless signaling works which genes in the nucleus they get activated so you will clone the wingless responsive elements with some minimal promoter okay and minimal promoter along with your luciferase or you say i take hedgehog signaling hedgehog response elements clone or notch responsive genes and then so you can ask as many questions you already know what kind of you know role wingless or hedgehog or notch or you know jackstat uh, etc are playing in development so you can with such reporter you can do all this reverse genetic screen come up with candidate genes and once you have those candidate genes validated in secondary screen what we do we then go and take mutants of those candidate genes characterize and this word is very important characterize mutants so how do we characterize mutant you will definitely immediately try to see some phenotype some developmental phenotype if you are in let's say wingless or hedgehog or this or the i specific phenotypes we already talked about you already know what kind of phenotypes wingless shows you know what kind of phenotypes hedgehog mutants have what kind of mutants notch has so you have already now the mutants you are confident this was reproduced twice in ex vivo screen as candidate and the mutant shows the phenotype from where to go uh, so from here where to go any idea what can be done how you will characterize this mutant the developmental phenotype and the biological function here comes very important point in the post genomic era in post genomic era we have to go and understand what function how these candidate candidate gene plays a role in let's say i development or whichever biological question you are pursuing you have to bring in answer that your protein so this is the nucleus cytoplasm so your protein is how do uh, how do, does it perform its function where in the cellular function cellular context in i development this protein plays its role which means the why this gene is important why it is showing phenotype we know the whole proteome the relationship between genome and the proteome we know genes 
they don't work in isolation. A single gene giving you I phenotype does not mean this single gene is working in isolation. We had to find the biological context within the protein in the biochemical pathways. And there are functional genomics tools. You can understand this role or there are bi hardcore biochemistry tools as well. One essential thing we uh, try to, the question we try to address is, since we are having this candidate genes, wingless pathways known, eye development pathways known, uh, so you already know some eye mutants. You know the eye protein, uh, eye specific proteins and their function, how they play a role. So you will try to bring your candidate gene in existing pathways. You will try to see if my new candidate gene is functionally relevant to previously known pathway. Well, look, if you use wingless responsive element, we already know wingless pathway. We have specifically used wingless responsive element. It means our candidate gene has to somehow feed into pre-existing knowledge about wingless. It could be novel gene, which is not known to the world because we have found this gene out of 15,000 genes and you know all the forward genetic screens, they could not you know saturate those 15,000 or the total genome of the flies or mouse, etc. So you have to bring this and see if the candidate genes are functionally relevant. One possibility is, and, and the way we think is, let's say we discovered a gene A, and this gene A may interact with X, which interacts with, you know, Z, which interacts with M, and, you know, we have the wingless or I specific phenotype, what, whichever biological function you are understanding. In this case, you are assuming that this is an interacting partner. But we may be wrong. It may not be having a direct protein interaction may not have direct protein interaction. But jury is out there and you are the one who have to bring answer. You have to bring answer for both the questions and you know, you already know, let's say X is known, Z is known, M is known. You discovered A as a new component. When you cross A with X or A with Z, A with M, you do see wingless phenotypes or I specific phenotype, which, which means our new gene A is one of the genetic modifier of the previously known pathway or the genes. But now the question is, how do we discover A biochemically, physically interact with them? Or it could be A is having no role here, a is a totally novel pathway you have discovered, which is not known. And you know, X, Z, M is another pathway and they somehow then crosstalk, okay? In this case, this is not biochemically or physically interacting directly with these known proteins. So first thing, of course, first thing first, first thing is we have this known proteins. What we, in, I mean, people used to do is uh, yeast to hybrid. It's a heterologous system in the yeast. So we use, you know, uh, 
cdna of uh, a clone it uh, in such a way that it's a reporter system and leg z reporter is used there uh, under some uh, you know um, uh, what we call the um, gal4 binding sites okay uh, this yeast cell will contain uh, cdna library of all the all cdna library which is cloned with let's say um, gal4 uh, which is not uh, uh, I'm forgetting the whole system, but the idea is that R A is cloned with, I think it's a Lexi binding sites. I forgot, I apologize for getting about this whole system, but idea is that if A protein, because this yeast is going to contain the constructs for our A, and then yeast cells will be uh, containing uh, individual constructs for all the cDNA library of fly cells or whichever uh, organism you're working on. Now, if A in this cell is interacting with Z, they together will make an activation of this leg Z possible only, this is only possible when the M, uh, sorry, Z and A, they are interacting, the two proteins are interacting. They, they are fused, their CDNAs are fused to the uh, VP16 leg A binding site, uh, if I remember correctly, which means here we have the leg A binding sites, not the US binding sites. And this interaction will result in activation of Lexi. And we will see on, you know, we have these individual colonies and we streak them to see which ones give us blue color. So this is just an indication in a heterologous system. It may still not be physiologically relevant because it's, it could be an artifact in the yeast. You have to eventually go in the fly cells or mouse cells, whichever model system you're working in, and do biochemical experiments there. Uh, advantage of these two hybrid system, just like the reverse genetic screen is, you know, it's, a, it's in small plates, you can screen all possible, uh, you know, available cDNAs of, uh, fly or mouse and then try to see which can be potential uh, interacting partner. But eventually you'll have to go into uh, the model organism whose gene it is and do co-immunoprecipitations, we call co-IPs. Um, what we do, let's say if we have, uh, we have discovered gene A, we, what we can do, we can take A, and fuse it with some epitope tags, let's say flag tag or MIC tag, et cetera, against whom antibodies are present. These are very widely used epitopes. And you can you know, make transgenic cells or you can make transgenic flies. If you have antibodies against Z and M already, you simply make total protein extract, you pull down with anti-flag, anti-flag, antibody is going to bind to your protein A and you pull it down through co uh, through immunoprecipitation and what you do, you run the Western blot on Western blot, you now probe the Western blot with antibody for Z or M. What you're assuming, you're assuming I have immunoprecipitated a, which is fused to flag tag or make tag, whichever you used. If A is interacting directly with Z and M or this complex, which is already known, I should have 
these ones precipitated in my immunoprecipitation. We call this co-immunoprecipitation. Now, on the Western blot, you use antibody against Z or antibody against M. Let's say this one is your mock line. Mock means where no uh, A is present tagged with flag. Empty vector control also we call this. And this one is where you have the experimental uh, your transient. Here, if you do see after Western blot, if you do see signal for Z or M, you say, okay, A is interacting with Z or M or whatever. But it is still not clear that they are interacting directly with each other. Okay, you have to do, uh, in order to validate this experiment, you have to do re reciprocal immunoprecipitation as well. What you do, you use antibody against Z or antibody against M, co-immunoprecipitate, and then prove with flag to see if flag is being pulled down. And, but this gives you an idea that they are most likely part of one biochemical complex. The other thing I said, it could be your A is not at all interacting with the M. How do we, how do we then decipher a function of A and its interacting partners? You can still use this transgenic cell line or embryos in flies or in, in, in mouse or whichever system you're working on. And you simply now using anti-flag or whichever epitope you used, or you may have generated your own antibody. Remember the first thing we do when we discover a new gene, our uh, aim is to generate antibody against our gene of interest. Because here we are pulling down transgene. A. And this is under, may not be, a, uh, uh, this is not endogenous. When we make transgenic, you know, this transgene is present with two endogenous copies of wild type A. So this is a kind of, you know, not physiological state. If we have our antibody, we don't need to generate uh, this cell line. We will take cells or embryos and then, you know, isolate proteins, use antibody against A, you know, precipitate, and we will presume that A interacting with M, with N, the whole biochemical complex is precipitated. Now, we don't know, because this is a novel thing, we don't know which proteins are working. In this case, we send this for mass spec. And in the mass spec, we get, you know, the spectrogram, which give us just the uh, composition of the whole biochemical complex based on, you know, ionization of these proteins, uh, spectra is generated, and there are uh, softwares which deduce which proteins are these ones. Okay, so in this case also, uh, in earlier times, we used to run, you know, gels, a protein gel where we have our mock and then anti A, and then, you know, we try to purify as much as possible and then try to see bands on Comasi stain gels. And we used to, you know, cut these bands individually and get them sequenced. And each protein spectra tells us, you know, which protein it is. But nowadays with latest mass spec technology, you can just send in the whole proteome and then uh, these are very sophisticated uh, spec, highly sensitive. You can, you don't need to have this, you know, uh, Comasi stain means a certain detection limit on the gel. If it's not visible, you won't be able to uh, cut the band. So you will lose it. So this is how we, uh, you know, go from 
genomics to the proteomics and then try to, and okay, so you let's say now discover uh, M, N, uh, K, L, new proteins. Now what you do? You have more questions to ask. So every new answer brings new question. So you say, okay, I'm going to take mutants, mutant, mutant, take these mutants, do all what you did for A, and bring in the context how you know it fits in the eye development. That's how we are deciphering the black box of uh, biological cell when we are trying to understand cellular function. What time it is now? In 50, sir. Okay, let's take a 10 minutes break here. Is it okay? Let's take a 10 minutes break. So let's do a question, which is, uh, which will help us, you know, uh, employ what we have gone through uh, over last so many lectures, trying to learn about these methodologies or tools. Uh, imagine you have uh, you are working with uh, with the stem cell differentiation model so you have cell lines and what you are doing you are trying to uh, screen for you know um, intestinal development how the intestine you know uh, develops um, what are the genes which are involved there uh, how, how they play their role in in differentiation etc and what do you do you do a uh, small molecule or what we call in, uh, you know a more fancy word is pharmacogenetics pharmacogenetics okay what we do we take small molecules uh, chemical compound library and we add them in cells Okay. These cells are system comprises of, you know, let's say these are differentiated cells. We have a very well defined differentiation model. Let's say these are the uh, stem cells and these are differentiated cells. When we add, you know, certain uh, stimulus or a signal, you know, they differentiate. Now, we want to do a, this small molecule screen to learn about how can we induce this differentiation other than this stimulus A. So what we do, we, we do it take similar, you know, high throughput methodology, you know, where we uh, grow cells in uh, plates, then add our compounds. Imagine you have a compound library, um, chemical compound library of nearly uh, thousand small molecules you screen one by one and then try to see if stem cells, they go and differentiate into intestinal cells. One is of course, you can look at the morphology, uh, but of, you, you may also know, you should know some of the marker genes. 
of differentiation of intestinal cells. When you differentiate, you can simply immunostain. So how will you correlate with a small molecule? effect with differentiation. So if you know already marker for differentiation of intestinal cells, you will simply take, you know, antibody against that particular anti uh, antibody against, let's say, gene uh, X, and then stain these cells. If they are stained, you say, okay, uh, this is behaving as, you know, the uh, a stimulus, and we have a clear uh, stem cell to differentiation model. You can do such things for all thousand compounds. You may find, you know, hardly two are or three are behaving like this. Now, the real thing is to understand how they are actually contributing to th this differentiation. What changes they are inducing? So, how will you? How will you discover effect of, let's say, compound 23 and compound, you know, 102 on differentiation? You can do multiple different rules, but of course, the more straightforward is you simply do transcription profiling. Now this transcription profiling is also trying to understand here you have single marker using antibody. Transcription profiling is going to tell you genome-wide genome-wide changes in gene expression in differentiated cell. So you will take total RNA from differentiated cell versus total RNA from stem cells, and then do RNA seq. Or in past, we used to do the microarrays. We learned about microarrays as well, and then we know which genes are expressed in stem cells and which genes are being induced by our compound 23 or compound 102. Is it clear so far? Yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then you can ask question if, you know, let's say we have found in this transcription profiling, we found, you know, uh, 200 key genes uh, which are involved in intestinal differentiation. And you can ask if they are really important. If these 200 genes which we have, you know, uh, through NGS or whatever we have discovered, if they are really important. You can decide and go to RNAi, knock down one by one these 200 and look at this. So knock them down, in differentiated cells or in stem cells and then try to see the effect. You have the compound, you add compound here, and then you knock them down and see if this differentiation is taking place or no, if they are so crucial. Okay. If let's say out of 200, you do, you're lucky, you, you find effect of five, very drastic effect and they don't differentiate. you still don't know how these five are playing a role here. These genes can be A, B, C, D, E. How A, B, C, D, E, each one, they could be totally different pathways. They could be one complex. So you have to go through the same route what we just 
did in in the previous part of this lecture let's say generate antibody against a antibody against b c d e etc localize them localize a b c d in inside cell try to see where they are in the cell they are in the nucleus they are in the cytoplasm they are on the cell membrane they are on the chromatin etc once you get an idea of course these five genes you discovered they must if you are lucky they must have some known function one of them may have some known known function if you are very lucky they could be totally novel genes and you have a lifetime opportunity to contribute to the knowledge by characterizing each of these genes in this pathway is it clear and in the previous part of the lecture we did talk about how we are going to characterize these genes one thing we did not talk about is you know and let's bring it there now imagine your gene a localizes in nucleus and you see it on chromatin in cells co-localization onto chromatin so you assume that a it could be so you hypothesize a could be a transcription factor or a could be a chromatin binding factor it binds to chromatin or chromosomes now you have to now prove this you have to now validate this because you get a clear evidence you get data if it is in the nucleus it's on the on the chromatin it co-localized with the chromosomes it's very simple you have antibody or you can if you don't have antibody you can have a fused to gfp or a b fused to gfp c fused to gfp and then do similar experiments or a fused to epitope tags mic tag etc whose antibodies are available the ideal is you have antibody against a you generate your own antibody and then you say okay i'm not going to do experiments to find out if a binds to chromatin and the tool we use normally is chromatin immunoprecipitation pre in this case what we do we we will take these cells normal cells and we expose them to formaldehyde which is a chemical crosslinker we add in the media formaldehyde what it will do it will crosslink protein dna protein protein wherever they are they will be crosslinked cell will be dead now but we have frozen the state of protein dna wherever they are we after formaldehyde cross linking we shear the chromatin we isolate chromatin from these cells and what we do we shear it into small pieces because chromosomes are big so we break them down into small pieces chromatin becomes like you know 200 to uh 500 base pair or let's say 1000 base pair length and now in the app and off after sharing what we do we add antibody against a wherever a will be bound let's say with this fragment a is bound with this fragment a is bound with this fragment a is bound antibody will bind there and it, it is just a simple immunoprecipitation now and we do it, pull it down and what we will have in the pellet we will have all the chromatin which is bound by a and all the chromatin which is not bound by a will be in the supernatant we will discard this keep this one purify dna from this one and we can do ngs and we can show a is present on chromatin as well as we can 
deduce this is very important because we have sequences of all the dna where a was bound we can align them and then try to see if a has specific consensus binding site in the dna if there is none you know it doesn't this experiment doesn't prove that a is a dna binding factor what it proves it's a chromatin binding factor it may have nothing to do direct uh, with direct binding of dna but with let's say histone proteins or it's not directly binding to chromatin it's part of a complex which binds onto chromatin but from the dna sequence you can determine very easily the genomic location which genes they are so you find all the genome wide binding pattern of a same thing we do for you know uh, methylation profiling of cells etc uh, people interested in uh, genome stability genome integrity people who work with transposons uh, you know they do uh, similar kind of analysis to understand dna methylation because that that's in, and that's in modern silencing of the transposons any questions Sir, how will we differentiate if our gene is directly bound to the chromatin and not in a complex? How do we differentiate if our gene is uh, directly bound to chromatin or it is in a complex? Very good question. For that, we'll have to go deeper. Uh, we'll have to see if it is chromatin bound, then we will purify uh, the whole A complex. If we have the A complex purified, that will give us ample information that, and if it is chromatin bound, before you know, uh, before you you start doing experiments or planning experiment, just go through uh, bioinformatic analysis, try to find some domains because chromatin binding proteins they usually have some domains. If let's say it has a domain which is already known to bind to some histones, to some uh, chromatin factors, you can then design experiment to prove that it is directly binding to some of the histone proteins or modifications there or whatever. But if none of such indications are present, then of course, if you have uh, the whole complex of A, you will have to do experiments to prove that a is directly bound to the chromatin by you know uh, doing some in vitro experiments you can assemble nucleosomes in vitro mix only a and then try to show and it, these are experiments peter becker is, is a, a peter becker's lab and of course many other labs are, are, are expert in these experiments if if you are interested read their papers so in vitro nucleosomal assembly mixed with A and then try to see if A binds to nucleosomes. If it, it can bind as a single protein, as, as an individual protein in the absence of its complex partners, you will conclude at least in vitro it's binding to chromatin directly. If it doesn't then bring in B, C, D, its components, um, its, its complex members and then see if it comes uh, onto uh, nucleosomes. Clear? Yes, sir. Sir, uh, uh, yeah. so can we do the staining as well of these respective proteins, like where as a preliminary test thing, like preliminary experiment? Can we do like take that complex somehow and then stain it with the respective antibodies and see the localization? Of course, it of course. So, yeah. but if it's a novel thing, you have to get to the complex first. Only then you will get antibodies and do immunostaining. Okay. And the second thing is that, <clears throat> sorry. so in the, um, so the experiment that you mentioned that we'll be doing the RNAi and doing knocking down the five genes that we, if we found, if we find that they're very important, but uh, did you like say, like mention that um, we knock them down together, like five of them, that we knock them down because if we are checking the interaction or the effect of one protein on the other one, is it possible that we knock one down and see the impact of knocking it down on the other, like the expression on the expression of the other proteins, like to correlate the um, 
the um, to correlate the uh, the functionality of the two proteins is it possible like before going into the localization and doing the further experimentations is it isn't it easier to do the knocking down of the one protein or one gene and then uh, seeing looking at look, uh, checking the expression or impact it has on the other proteins and then going into the other um, experiments so in order to determine the expression of other proteins you need to have antibodies okay if so you do it on western right. blot you can do it through real time pcr through rt pcr you can determine if it's having effect at the transcription level that can be done so you knock down so the question let me rephrase your question so you are asking if i find let's say 10 candidates in my screen secondary screen validated so i knock down let's say candidate 1 and look at look at expression of other nine is this the question yes all right so i think my, i missed that part when you mentioned that we will we'll be looking at the no, novel genes or the novel proteins because what my question is referring to is the fact that we know all the genes and all the proteins and then we are just looking like the effect of one uh, knocking down of the one gene on the other i think i just got it no no yeah. uh, so when when i say in reverse genetics we know the gene know the gene means either you have an educated guess and you picked up you know 50 or 10 individual known genes and then you are trying to look at their effect on some uh, developmental pathway which you are interested in okay there it can be done let's say you take mutant of candidate 1 look at expression of candidate 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 apart what if these candidates you know they are not actually having a huge impact at the transcription level but at the post translational level or post transcriptional level in this particular case where you discovered a as a chromatin binding factor yes there you will see if there is an effect on b c d e f or candidate 2 3 4 5 because this is a chromatin binding factor it may be impacting one or more candidates themselves as well did i answer your question yeah i think i got it yeah thank you other questions so is momina around momina is not there so some of you ask me if there are some practice questions and so we have actually you know instead of giving you practice questions these are actually the way you have to think about uh, otherwise development is just you know memorizing some known facts and uh, you know uh, it becomes a, a course with rote learning that's not how how i want you to learn development i want you to develop a more experimental approach so that you can you know design experiments uh, based on your knowledge of development how developmental biology proceeds uh, how different biological pathways you know they uh, contribute to uh, different processes in you know uh, gastrulation to differentiation or gynogenesis etc but those are known facts what we have covered if we have covered that you know nanos and caudal are posterior maternal genes and bicord and hunchback are anterior maternal genes um, i mean that is already discovered that is already proven but if i throw a question about bicord but you have to design an answer through an experimental strategy like we are doing that's how through a known fact or something which is already known you individually are designing in the exam or in your life that okay you know this is how i can look at bicord i know the bicord function uh, this is how i will bring answer to this bicord so you have uh, known function for for example um the uh, it's 
skipping from my mind. The, the, the pi proteins in the C elegans, okay, uh, the, the P1 blastomeres. I mean, if I am just going to ask you, okay, show me the how it's dividing stem cell differentiated, stem cell differentiated. I mean, that's not the purpose of whole learning is, and, and that's not how uh, you should be thinking. So you should be thinking about design, experimental design. Rather, I would say I go one step back and I say, you should be defining a question. After this course, this is the last course in your uh, core courses in, in major. So you have to now learn to define questions. And after defining questions, you will be able to uh, bring answers. So today is um, Thursday. So I covered more or less, you know, you know, today was like a long recitation, I would say nearly one and a half hour uh, recitation. So we will not have recitation today because we covered already. I would like you to start preparing for an extensive, let's say I give you I give you just one. So we'll have uh, today is uh, what is date today? Fourth March. Sir. Yeah, fourth. So our next lecture is on uh, Tuesday, which is ninth, and then on eleventh. So ninth and eleventh, we will have. Uh, mock midterm. It may be just one question or maybe two questions, okay? But deep thought provoking questions. So revise all your concepts um, and then let's say uh, you attempt those, those two questions uh, and we'll have two, two such quizzes uh, next week, okay? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Clear? Yes, sir. Good. Very good. So I see you next week, Tuesday. Inshallah. Allah face.